Our scripture reading for this morning is going to be the same as next week, Lord willing. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. In a 2008 interview, Tom Cruise was asked by Oprah Winfrey, quote, So Scientologists don't believe that their way is the only way? And Tom Cruise's response was, no. Now, if you know anything about Oprah Winfrey, you'll know that she is a strong believer that there has to be multiple ways to get to God or to get to heaven more specifically. And so she insisting that to be the case is going to put people in the hot seat, you might say, and really question their religious beliefs and where they stand. Willie Nelson says, you get to heaven your way and I'll get to heaven my way. The problem with that is that both ways are incorrect. I don't care how right Willie Nelson may be, or not really, uh, doesn't matter. The point is, is that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And so, with this idea of enter in by the narrow gate, I wanted to deal with this idea of Christians being narrow-minded. Have you ever been accused of being narrow-minded? Well, let's dive into this and make some points as from the world's point of view. Uh, being narrow-minded, let's go ahead and define that. It is not willing to listen or to tolerate other people's view. Um, to be prejudiced. Now, prejudice, of course, is to prejudge, to, to make a decision based upon whatever outside things that you see, you might say. In other words, and I'll use this a couple of times, but that all white people are racist. Why? Because they're all white. <laughs> all white people are white. And so, in that sense, that's a prejudice. But we'll see in this next definition, and I think it's more closely related, it'd be a bias. So, here's another way of looking at it. If one is narrow-minded or exclusively minded in today's society, he will be considered bigoted, prejudiced, Bias, small minded, and intolerant. To be narrow minded is about the most politically incorrect thing that a person can be today. It is politically incorrect to stand on some of the issues today in our society, whether that's abortion, um, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and the list goes on and on and on. Let's consider again to really broaden our understanding of where these people are coming from, what the world is really thinking when they accuse us of being narrow-minded. Fifteen signs you're narrow-minded. We'll go through these quite quickly. You tend to generalize everything. Generalize in saying that all white people are racist. Or, well, well, we'll continue. We don't want to spend a lot of time on this. You know it all. Um, that idea that you, you are unwavering, you, you are fixed in your position, you're, you're not going to move. Uh, you are deeply habitual, and I think that that could be a very good thing. You get up at 6 o'clock every morning, that can be very good, but what they're saying is that there's a condemnation in the sense that you're just doing it by habit. Maybe that would be worshiping every Sunday, it's just a habit you're really not involved in. Of course, we've dealt with that, right? So some of these things may apply to you and me. And some of them aren't. Not all of them are going to just hit the nail on the head. You assume everything. So that idea that you've already made predetermined decisions or an outcome of a certain thing. So you've already assumed an end before it actually uh, transpires. So you're judgmental. Of course, that idea of being judgmental is not getting all the facts before a judgment is made. Uh, it's the idea going back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is expressing that you get the splinter out of, out of, I mean, get the beam out of your eye before you try to get the splinter out of your brother's eye. And so being judgmental is you don't see your own faults, you only see the faults of others. Number six, you get easily offended. The idea that, that we become irate, we get all upset, uh, hot under the collar when someone disagrees with us and says that we're wrong and so on. Now, some of these, you know, there's, uh, it kind of goes both ways, right? 
Uh, you are xenophobic. Xenophobic is really an umbrella for all kinds of phobias. So uh, the, probably one of the ones that would be at the top of the list is that if you would speak against homosexuality, then you're a homophobic, which would fall under the umbrella of a uh, xenophobic. So number eight, you have trust issues. If you're so fixed in what you believe, then you don't trust what others might say. Uh, you'll see this in some religions, in fact. Uh, one of the religions that it's actually, that, that they're, they're condemned, that they're, they're almost banned, is Jehovah Witnesses. They are not to read from any other translation than their translation. They're not to watch any other sermons online. They're not supposed to expose themselves to any other religions. Don't have a Bible study unless you're the one that's in control and, and, and making the charge, if you will. So that's uh, that idea of trust issues that you, you have to really stay in this, this, this very limited realm because you don't want any of these outside influences or any other teaching. So, and some of these things can apply to us, like I say. Um, Number nine, you do not discuss your core beliefs with anyone. Now, this may be very true in the sense of kind of putting ourselves to the test. Are you reluctant to talk to someone about Jesus because you've already concluded they're not, they don't want to hear it? And so you don't talk to them about the Bible. You don't talk about, about your faith. You don't share the gospel with them. You don't tell them that we have a gospel meeting coming up because you've already determined, you've prejudged, they're not going to listen, but you don't discuss your beliefs with anyone because it goes back to that idea, you don't talk about religion or politics. So the world's going to say, that's narrow-minded. You're not open to, to hear other things, uh, other beliefs, if you will. Uh, you are unable to socialize at work or anywhere else. I mean, this, this guy is, is just so fixated on what he believes and, and how it's done, or whatever that case may be, uh, you, you can't work with him. You enjoy pinpointing the shortcomings of others. See, that goes back to the previous, the idea that you also you see only the, the faults of others. You don't see your own self. don't see your own faults. don't see your own miscomings. Um, you're so right. No one can tell you anything. And so you, you see the faults of others, but not your own, to get the beam out of your eye. And, uh, and, and when or, you, know, you, you just don't think that there's anything uh, false in regard to yourself. Number 12, you're not open to new ideas. That's kind of a given. Number 13, you fail to interact well with a friend once you discover a negative part of their personality. The world's going to say you're narrow-minded. If you, if you find out that someone has some kind of flaw and now you don't want to have anything to do with them, uh, whether it's their past, whether it's current or not. Number 14, you don't like anyone who disagrees with you. So you become an enemy to everyone who does not believe exactly how you believe or where you stand. Now this is the one that really got my goat. <laughs> Number 15, you're obsessed with righteousness. Um, you want to do everything right. You're not open to that there's other ways to do things. It's kind of how they would put it uh, to, to kind of whitewash it a little bit. But I find this quite interesting. Um, that's kind of combining some other lists. It certainly wasn't everything that I could have put up there. I could probably could have put 25 different uh, signs that you are narrow-minded. Well, I'm going to conclude that everyone is narrow-minded. Absolutely everyone is narrow-minded. And so let me give you some examples of how we might be narrow-minded. Are you just absolutely determined on a one-way street to go the one way that the, the sign points? Or are you open to, to go the opposite direction that the sign is, is uh, pointing? Um, what about uh, driving on the railroad tracks? Are you so narrow-minded to think you can't drive on the railroad tracks? I mean, what's wrong with you? Now, everyone would say, of course not. Everyone knows you don't drive on the railroad tracks. How about this? When you put on your socks and shoes, do you put on one sock and then the other sock and then a shoe and then a shoe? Or do you put on both your socks and then you put on both your shoes? Do you always start with the right? You, you have to start with the left? You see how we can kind of be uh, what we would call uh, OCD? about those and someone would even say CDO just because we got to put it in order. <laughs> yeah, is, is there anything wrong with being habitual along some of those lines? When you go and brush your teeth, do you always start on the right? Do you, I mean, what do you do as a general rule every time? When you cook an egg, 
You could fry it, you could do it over easy, over hard, omelet, boil it, poach it, etc. Is it narrow minded that whenever you go and sit down and you order eggs and you ask that those eggs be fried and they show up with scrambled eggs, are you so narrow minded not to say, okay, well, these are it's still eggs, it's still just the same? So we're all narrow minded to a certain degree. Is it narrow minded to refuse to have premarital marital sex? Is it narrow-minded to say, well, I'm just going to try a few drugs? Is it narrow-minded to vow never to lie, steal, or cheat? Is that narrow-minded? So is it narrow-minded when there are a thousand of prescriptions that the doctor could give you for your particular ailment? Is it narrow-minded that he's only going to give you one out of a thousand prescriptions that could be written? No. I asked Dolly about, you know, can you add uh, uh, to, to this? She says, yeah, one of them is that a, the only good snake is a dead snake. Now, how many of you feel that way? You know, there's a lot of people that feel that way. But that's, that's being quite narrow-minded. How about all politicians are crooks? You see how we prejudge someone? And so all people are really saying is, don't tell me where I'm wrong. I want to be open-minded. I want to think how I want to think. Don't apply your principles or standards to my life. That's what the world is really saying. But the truth is that the standard that we live by is not our own standard. And their standards are all going to differ between them. Our standard is right here. It's the word of God. That's where we stand. And so ultimately, what is truth? And so many are going to say that truth is subjective. It depends on the circumstance. And we had a sermon a couple of weeks ago about that. Situational Ethics. It, what, what's right or wrong depends upon the circumstance, not what's already been predetermined right or wrong. So in this circumstance, yes, I can commit fornication. In this circumstance, I can steal. In this circumstance, I can lie. And I'm still okay with God. I haven't transgressed anything because the circumstance dictates it. Well, then there really is no truth that you can stand on. There's no way to know the truth. And others would say that there are no absolutes. Now listen to that. Did you hear the statement? There are no absolutes. The first question you have to ask them is, is that an absolute? You just made an affirmative when there are no absolutes. That's a complete contradiction. It is like the person who says, I am intolerant of the intolerance of others. You can't do that. That's self-condemning. For someone to accuse us that exclusivity is wrong, that we are going to say, this is right, this is wrong, but there is black and white. If they're going to accuse us and say, that's wrong, they're guilty of the same by telling us that we're wrong. So don't be intimidated by those who would accuse you of being narrow-minded. People can't be sincerely wrong. Paul was. Paul was sincerely wrong. He thought he was right, but he was not. We may sincerely believe that the plane we are going on is going to take us to Denver and sincerely believe but that doesn't confirm it to be true. We might be headed in the wrong direction. Our beliefs, regardless of how deeply they were held, have no effect on reality. And we often use this idea of people having a feeling of being saved and so on. Jacob felt absolutely convinced. He was absolutely convinced that his son Joseph was dead. When his other sons presented Joseph's coat torn into pieces and splattered with blood. And it was years and years later before he was convinced otherwise. And he had to see the evidence for himself. And unfortunately there are going to be a lot of people who are going to kind of say that there are no absolutes, there is no truth. Um, you're narrow-minded 
And therefore, I'm better because I'm more broad-minded, I'm open-minded, I'll, I'll take into all kinds of things. And they're just still going down this broad path that leads to destruction. So, the thing that really counts is not the sincerity of our faith, but the object of our faith. We need to ask ourselves, is what I'm trusting in really trustworthy? Can I really believe the Bible? Now, I'm going to assume that we're all on the same page. That we do all believe that these documents that I hold in my hand, as ancient as they may be, is the Word of God. These are absolutes. And contained in the Bible are truths. That if you're going to be a Christian, you are going to have to be narrow-minded. To be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me share some passages with you along these lines. There is only one God. In Isaiah 44 and verse 6. And in, in what's interesting is that the Bible talks about many gods. <laughs> um, but it's the, it's the play on how the world views deity or deities. It says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Again, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. This idea of unity, there's only one, 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 one. That's pretty narrow-minded to think that there's only one God. But that's the truth. That there are high standards by which God would have us to live by. The concept that, yes, we are a little obsessed with righteousness. We're a little obsessed with being right. And not right just some of the time, right all of the time. We want to be right before God. The world's going to say, that is too narrow-minded. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, Jesus is saying that there's not going to be one dot or one crossing of the T in that sense. And now, how narrow is that? How specific is that? It's quite specific. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, those who literally write the Bible, write the, the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament as we would know it, day in and day out, those were the scribes, the Pharisees are these very lofty, highly religious individuals. He says, if you're not going to exceed their righteousness, if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And that goes back to our, our passage. The broad way leads to destruction. Narrow way leads to life. Jesus is saying, you have got to up your game, if you will. You can't just go through life haphazardly, and it's no big deal. It's just sin is, eh, it's really uh, nothing to take into account. In James chapter 2 and verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. It's the concept that if you think that you can live by the old law and therefore demand that you go into heaven, James is saying, you transgress just one time. We talk about the little sin or a little white sin. 
That's us classifying. There's certainly different degrees. There's certain consequences for our sin, but sin is sin. And what's being expressed here is that if you miss it, miss the mark one time, that's it. There's no other hope it, as far as the law is concerned. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now you want to talk about a lofty goal for us to achieve in a degree of righteousness. God is saying, you be as holy, you be as pure as I am. I don't think it can get any more lofty. That is a high standard for us to grow for. Well, if we're going to stand on the truth, we have to believe that it is the truth. We see over in John chapter 14, or chapter 1 and verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, of course, this is Jesus Christ, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the definition of truth. In verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Of course, in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But let's, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, there's only one church. Now, there's where the rub begins for many in the world, is that y'all believe you're the only ones going to heaven. My first response to that is, well, isn't that who you want to be with? Those who believe they are going to heaven? I mean, that's a pretty good first step. It, it, I wouldn't want to associate myself with those who are going, I think we're going to hell. All of us are going to hell. We have no hope. I don't think I really want to be hanging out with those people or to, to rely upon whatever they're going to be telling me in regard to how to get to heaven if that's really what I'm wanting to do. So this idea of y'all think you're the only ones, see, that's too narrow-minded for them. They want to broaden that, that there's going to be many. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and will be saved. And so many false doctrines come from that teaching. And that teaching pushes, pushes them into another false doctrine that you can't fall from grace. Went to our neighbor from across the street, went to his funeral after he had committed suicide. And because he had believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, some 30 years before hadn't darkened the doors of a church building in decades, that preacher put him right into heaven because all you have to do is believe and you can't fall from grace. You see, it's narrow-minded to believe that there's an accountability, that there are things that we must do, that there is a righteousness in which we should apply to our lives, that there really is only one church that you should be associating yourself with. And so in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 8, we, we kind of key in on just a little bit and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my, Jesus says, my church. And the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, excuse me, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Death is not going to hold my church. One day, those bounds will be let loose, is what he's expressing. Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. We have different capacities, different talents, different abilities. So we being many are one body in Christ. And so as much as we would want to be open, if you will, and, and to listen to, to everyone, we must understand that this is the standard by which we live. This is how we're going to compare what's being taught. And we're going to have to see if it's coming from the scriptures. Because in our last point, we're going to obviously emphasize that Jesus' message is quite narrow. But it is for everyone. It's not limited to those who are 
white, middle class, 2.2 kids, great job, responsible, never been in jail, loves mom and daddy. You see how we sometimes put these, these stipulations on who we're going to talk to, who we're going to share the gospel with? And so in that sense, sometimes we are narrow-minded in, in our thinking and how we prejudge others. Jesus' message, as we would see over in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except by me. And then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, in regard to Jesus, it says, nor is there... Salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And in as, as harsh as it may sound, Joseph Smith can't save you. The Pope can't save you. No religion can save you. Zero. The Church of Christ can't save you. The body is saved by Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. In John chapter 10 and verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the door. He's the shepherd of the sheep. We being sheep must follow him. And in Matthew 11 and verse 28, to really point, make this point, Jesus' uh, narrow message is for everyone. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Although the way of entering is quite narrow, Lord willing, we'll talk about that next week. It is definitely narrow. It's not impossible. Jesus is just saying, you've got to do it my way. Because I am the way. I'd like to close with a, a little lengthy reading of Acts chapter 17. As a conclusion to our study. And I want you to see how uh, this passage will apply so, Acts chapter 17, we're going to begin reading in verse 24. God, there's only one. God who made the world and everything in it. This is Paul uh, on the, at the Areopagus in, in Athens, verse 22. Uh, Mars Hill is uh, also uh, named. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men. We shouldn't be at odds with one another, no matter what, what uh, nationality we are, what color we are. We all bleed red is the idea. One blood, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him though he is not far from each one of us. Now, what I'd emphasize about this is that idea that you've got to look for that narrow way. It's not going to fall in your lap. Not to be too repetitive. We'll be talking about that next week. For in him, in him we live and move and have our being. Not in these idols. Remember, this is the same place where Paul saw all these idols to all these different gods, and even one to the unnamed God, just in case I missed one. For in Him, in the true God, this only God, we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Therefore, 
since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to, of this to all by raising him from the dead. In these last few, last couple of verses here, Paul is calling them to repent. Realize that your Broadway, not even though in that sense, that he's not using that term, that they have all these many gods. You see how broad-minded. They haven't narrowed it down to one single god. Paul saying, no, contrary to how you've been worshipped, there's only one. And this one God is saying, you better repent. You better repent of all this idol worship and so on. And then we're going to see in verse 31, he will judge the world in righteousness. There's only one standard by which you should be living. It's God's standard. It's by what he says, not the devising of man, no more than how you went and shaped this stone, shaped this wood, shaped this clay, whatever you did to make it like you wanted it. And then you lived your life and however you felt was necessary to please this God, to please this idol, he's saying you better repent of that and understand that's not the right way. That there is only one God and he's the only one in whom he, that should be served and there is only one righteousness and that you need to live by his righteousness, not the devising of your own. That's very narrow-minded. Because one day, we're going to give account to that God. And you only have one Savior. It says, He will judge the world in righteousness, God's righteousness, by the man, that is Jesus Christ, whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And we've got to put our faith and our trust in him. We've got to live by his standard of righteousness. And yes, I would say the whole world is narrow-minded in some form or fashion. But... It's either God's way or the highway to hell way. There's no middle ground. So we make that choice on a daily basis. Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve myself? Am I going to go into that narrow gate? Be narrow-minded but right with God? Or am I going to be politically correct and appease the world by going down this broad way? That leads to destruction. Won't we all make the right choice day in and day?